You know, questions are tough, aren't they? Especially uncomfortable questions. You know those questions. Uh, I, I heard a preacher kind of begin a sermon. I was listening to a sermon on this topic this week. And he, he said something that kind of struck a nerve with me. Uh, because my ADHD-ness, uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but some of I have fellow ADHD people in the audience today. Uh, my missing big things in life sometimes. Uh, sometimes it, ha it has me having to answer uncomfortable questions. And one of the questions that preacher mentioned, I, I recognize I, I do this to my kids a lot. It's that question, what were you thinking? And uh, I think my wife's already asked me that this morning as we've been dealing with dishwasher, I mean, we're dealing with this washing machine that's leaking and everything. And uh, what were you thinking? And you know the answer, right? I wasn't, you know. <laughs> that's the whole problem. I wasn't thinking. We, we struggle sometimes. We, we have this frailty about us, these mental lapses. And sometimes they're small and they're really not big. Sometimes they're, they're big and they cause major problems and rifts and in relationships and things uh, I recognize this morning how often I sometimes say that to my kids what are you thinking and it's really a rhetorical question because I know the answer to the question they're here we're at this point because you were not thinking now uh, my kids are not unique I think every child ever been alive has probably heard that from their parents at some point in time and place but questions that are uncomfortable sometimes are good for us. They're not fun, but they're good for us. It's kind of like uh, exercise, right? Some people think exercise is fun. I don't understand those people. But I recognize that exercise is good for us, right? I recognize that there's benefits to exercise. And the same thing comes when we have to deal and answer tough questions. When you ask questions that, that you're not really comfortable with the answer that you'll have to have, or, or maybe you are not really have not processed the answer, maybe you haven't stopped to think about what's going on. So when Paul gets into chapter 3 of Galatians this morning, he starts with a series of questions. He kind of knows the answers to these questions. They're questions not necessarily designed for a response, but rather questions designed to make the people, the churches of Galatia, think about the situation they're dealing with. Because good questions, even hard questions, even difficult questions, can really benefit us moving forward and, and shape us and mold us. And so Paul's not wanting them to go back into, he, he's trying to correct a behavior, and he also doesn't want that behavior to continue to be a residual problem. So Paul asks some difficult questions. He says, you foolish Galatians. And that's harsh. And it would, have, it would have immediately... You know, Paul sometimes says some things in Scripture that we would be really uncomfortable hearing in church. Okay, uh, Especially if you go back into the original language, Paul uses some words that, we would, that would probably be on the no-no list uh, for your kids. He, he just uses some language and says some things sometimes, you know, like this right here. We would be very uncomfortable if we had a child call another, if, if they said, you foolish brother, or you foolish sister. We, that would make us a little uncomfortable. Well, Paul is trying to make people a little uncomfortable. Sometimes a preacher may say something, it may sound like a little bit of a shock statement. And you might say, I'm not sure he should have said that or not. But guess what? <laughs> you usually remember that, don't you? Uh, you know, that's exactly what Paul's doing. He's trying to shock their sister. Listen, you got to wake up. He said, who has bewitched you? Now, uh, when you hear, hear the term bewitched, what do you think about? A 70s TV show about a witch, right? Uh, many of you do. It, it, some of you are too young for that. But there was a, a show. Um, a, you know, I, I grew up watching it on like Nick at Night and stuff. Some of those shows on reruns. Uh, but uh, the idea, though, it really comes from... Uh, kind of putting a spell or putting a trance on someone. Uh, and he says, listen, who, and it's singular, he says, who has bewitched you? 
Paul frequently uses language that sometimes we'll miss, but in this particular instance, I believe he's probably drawing in, drawing us to recognize that there are, there are spiritual forces happening here that have deceived people. And, and Paul talks about that pretty regularly, doesn't he? He does that in Ephesians. He talks about it uh, at really specifically that, listen, we're not, we're, we, we sometimes see other people as the enemy or we see other situations at the enemy, but it's really the stuff that's happening behind the scenes that's really the problem. Satan's working hard. Satan's minions are working hard. There, there are spiritual forces. And he says, listen, who, who's got a hold on you and put a trance on you? He said, because before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. You know the centrality of Jesus, that Jesus is the answer, that Jesus is everything, that after everything runs through Jesus. You intellectually know that, but somebody has got into your thinking. And I'm, and I'm Paul, and I'm saying, what are you thinking? You've been bewitched, you've been tricked, something in your thinking is off, or maybe you're just not thinking at all. And he said, I want to learn one thing from you. And he asked another question. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? You had the law. You had uh, specifically, we need to be really careful here when we're in Galatians to understand two things. One, he's not talking about many of the works that we might think about. Uh, but two, he is talking about works, okay? He's got some specific works in mind. And we need to understand that those we can have works that we're trying to earn and gain our salvation from in this life. Whether or not we even recognize it or not, we can have those. But he's got some specific things. We're, we don't deal with those things, okay? Typically. We're not dealing with circumcision as a general rule, as a, as a divider in our churches. We're not dealing with ceremonial food laws as dividers in our churches. But there is division in churches. And he says, listen... I, I want to know from you whether or not those things, those, when you had those things in the past, you, you had circumcision before this. You, you had the, the rights and access to these food laws. You, you had the law. Did you get the spirit from that? Was everything good or were you just sitting there yearning and longing and wanting something more? And that's exactly the situation they were in. They wanted more. They wanted... They wanted the Spirit to come and breathe life and re-energize the people. Well, the Spirit has come now. And he says, listen, why, now that you have this moment of the Spirit, are you trying to go back over here and receive something from these works that are ultimately dead? He said, where did you get it? He says, are you so foolish? I mean, that, that term literally means, like, do you not have the mental capability to understand this? Paul's being harsh. He, he is shocking the system. He's saying, wake up. And he says this, he says, after beginning by the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Did you come to know God through this experience that you had with the Spirit living within you? But now you think you've got to take over and you've got to do these things in order to have God in your life? Are you, are you, do you believe that this is a situation where you've got to have God on the front end and then hard work and determination on the back end? Now, we as Americans love hard work and determination. And it's really hard for us to think that we can get something without hard work and determination. And there are many things in this life that if you're going to want to get them and obtain them in this life, you're going to have to use hard work and determination. Salvation from God is not one of those things. And we need to recognize and understand and know that. He, says, he continues with the questions. Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? Is this all worthless? And he says, so I'm going to ask you again. Notice how many questions he's going through. Question after question. Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? Or does he do it by your believing what you heard? Is it because of a faith that you have in Jesus, a faith that you have in God that you came to understand and, and see the working and seeing all these powerful tools that God's putting together in the world. And he said, and remember now Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
It was through the faith of God. Real quick, I want to go back one slide real quick, then we're going to go forward two slides. But I want to really just key in to gather what I want us to gather from these first six verses with this last line. After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Now let's go forward to. We need to understand that salvation does not come through a mutual effort. Salvation is not one part Daniel and 99 parts God. The work of salvation is God's alone. Now, I can choose to reject that. But we need to be really careful in our churches. Because we've, in our churches, taught against a teaching that's sometimes popular in religious circles. We call it once saved, always saved. Once you're saved, you can't leave it. I want to, to warn us about an equally uh, terrible thought. And that's one sin already lost. Okay, uh, I understand that you could live a life of rebellion after coming to God and you can choose to reject God. But church, if, you, if you're in an environment where you think the first time you slip up, God's just like got this eternal dry erase board where he's just like constantly writing your name and wiping it off, writing your name and wiping it off. I, I'll be honest, I thought that for a lot of my life about how God was thinking of me. And it's really unhealthy. I'm not saying anybody taught me that directly, but the sum of whatever I had come to believe, I, that's where I ended up. That is not how God works. God never stops loving His people. Does it disappoint Him when you choose sin? Absolutely. But does, is God just sitting there ready to wipe you off the second you do it? Equally, absolutely not. God... When, you know, when we're talking about salvation, it's not going to be through our hard work and determination. and it, That's not how this thing works. As a matter of fact, Paul is spending this whole book literally teaching us that's not how this works. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. His faithfulness, not our faithfulness. Us trusting in his grace and mercy and goodness. Not our grace and mercy and goodness. Because if you need, if it's my grace and mercy and goodness, it's going to flop. And it's going to fail. Because it is so insignificant and so incomplete. I'm trusting in God to save me. And so yes, can a person choose to rebel against God and walk away from God? I absolutely believe that. I believe there were people that did that. I believe the Bible talks about some people who did that. They chose to rebel against God. But you need to understand that God, when he, and really when Paul's going through these letters, he's calling a lot of people Christian that we might have already kind of written off. And God's not out trying to find people to erase. He's out trying to find people to add. And he is your father. And he loves you. And you keep your association with him. And he's going to keep his association with you. This is a bond that we have with our Heavenly Father. All right, let's contend. So understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So if you're living a life of faith and belief and in trust in God and His promises, you're, they're the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Gentiles were going to come to know God. It was in God's plan all along. And he announced the gospel, the good news in advance to Abraham. And th this is what he says the gospel is. Paul uh, gives several definitions of the gospel. Uh, and you could kind of, there's different ways in which you could, you could maybe verbalize the gospel. But this is one way he does it. He says, all nations will be blessed through you. The good news is that all the nations are going to be able to come through this faith that Abraham had, and you're going to be able to take hold of it. And all the nations are going to be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham. If you believe in God and you put your faith into God as Abraham did, you too, if you are relying on that faith, you're going to be able to have the same blessings of Abraham, that man of faith. You have the promises of Abraham. Sometimes we think, and we read stories, and we read stories like the story of Abraham. You know, you go through the story of Abraham, it's got a lot of cool parts. 
And sometimes we think, man, I just wish I, I was a person of faith like that. Well, Paul declares here that, listen, if you're putting your faith into Jesus, you don't have to have all the cool stories. You may just have a normal story, so to speak. And I don't mean that in a, I mean, no stories are alike and everybody goes through different things. I'm just saying maybe you, you were just, you haven't had a real, real rough, rough lot in life. Maybe you've had a really bad lot of life. I, I don't know where you're at, but all I know is that if you're a person of faith, if you're putting your trust into God, you can have the same promises that Abraham has. And that should cause us to have an, an upswelling of just praise to God for that. That I can touch into that. That I can be a part of that. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. If you're still relying on... This is what he's saying. He's saying this, and listen to this. He said, if you're still relying on getting all of this right, if you're still relying on your own perfections... You're living under a curse. And he says, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. If you want to earn your way, if you think it's through your good works you're going to get there, then you better get on the ball. Because you're going to be the first one to ever accomplish, the pro accomplish it. And newsflash, nobody in here, I love you guys, y'all are awesome, but you're not that good. And neither am I. We're not good enough to handle this. We need God. We need Jesus. And he says, clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Clearly, there is no one who's getting it all right. And some people have developed a theology about the New Testament, or the New Covenant that we have, that the New Covenant is just a slightly modified version of the Old Covenant. And that's just twisted thinking. That is not what... The Bible teaches when we come and read about the new covenant, it's about a covenant of faith and trust. It's about God's work. It's about God doing incredible things and us putting our trust and our faith into something that's much bigger than we are. He says the righteous are going to live by faith. You're going to be made right because you're living, trusting in God's goodness. So notice this, the plan of salvation. You know, we, we grew up, if you grew up in the churches of Christ, you know, the plan of salvation was something in the back of your Bible you wrote, and it had hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and maybe a sixth thing, be faithful unto death. You, you, you had those things. And we called that the gospel. A lot of time, I heard it called a lot in my life, the gospel plan of salvation. All those things are important. All those things are biblical. But... That is not the plan of salvation, okay? The plan of salvation is something that God has put into place, okay? So when we talk about the plan of salvation, it started when man rejected God in the garden. They wanted to be like God. They wanted to be gods of themselves. And it went through Abraham, it went through Moses, and ultimately ended in Jesus. The plan of salvation was that God foresaw a day that Jew and Gentile alike, everybody would have access to God the Father. And the, the plan of salvation, the plan of the way God was going to make salvation available to you, every one of you, all of us Gentiles, I'm pretty confident we're all Gentiles. I might be wrong, excuse me if you're an ethnic Jew in our midst today. But most of us Gentiles, we are ultimately blessed because God put together a plan and that plan of salvation was that through Abraham and then through Moses and the law and the writing of the law and then through the prophets and then ultimately when we come to Jesus, we have access to God the Father. That's God's plan of salvation. Now, what, how do we respond to that gospel? What do we do in response to that gospel? It's a whole different thing. But sometimes when we say the plan of salvation and here's the things you must do, we miss the boat because we're talking about things we must do. When salvation was something that was accomplished through Jesus on a cross and through an empty grave, an empty tomb, and he walked out. That's how salvation was accomplished. Not through something Daniel can do. Let's keep going. Verse 12. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Or the law that they had in place, the, the rules and restrictions, the way... God gave, gave Moses the law, and they had the writings, the, the, 
what we, we would know as the Torah, those first five books of the Old Testament. You understand that was not based on faith. It was based on performance. It was based on whether or not you could achieve these things. And the, the, the gospel, I mean, it says, the, the person who does these things, you're going to live by them. And he says, you need to remember and you need to know that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who's hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. We are receiving the promise of the Spirit. Now Paul kind of goes into something here that's kind of theological in nature. It's a study. And um, I want to just go ahead and go to this next slide. It's, it's the, the concept of God's atonement. All right? Uh, if you ever need to remember, you know, uh, this is obviously definitely not unique to me. But... Uh, atonement is something you can have study after study. There's all kinds of theories about how the Bible talks about atonement. But atonement is one of those churchy words. I, you know, if I go to somebody that's never stepped foot in a church, they're not have any idea what atonement means, okay? And so the easy way to remember this is to remember at one meant. All right, at one meant. And it's the idea, it's the concept of how, do, how does God reconcile sinful men and God and himself, how, how does he bring those together so they can have a unified relationship? And so the idea, and that's complicated, right? Uh, Paul just talked about it right now. Let's go back two slides real quick. He talks about this uh, God, that Jesus becomes a curse for us, okay? Uh, and there's a couple of really popular theories that you're going to hear a lot of. You'll hear things about... Uh, and they're, they're big church words, okay? Like penal substitution, atonement, uh, PSA, uh, Christus Victor theory. Uh, there's, there's several things. And all those theories have scriptures they can go to and say, look, this is how God reconciles man and God. And, but I would venture to say to you that rather than any of us taking on one theory, this would be, um, maybe this passage would frequently be that uh, substitute substitutionary atonement that God would God takes our place on the cross okay and the Bible talks about that but I, I would venture to say that it is much broader and bigger and greater than any of those individual contexts that it is generally kind of a sum of the parts of all those things that anytime we try to understand how God reconciles with man it's going to be above our pay grade and it's going to be hard for us to understand and it's a a complex issue. And I would just venture to say that man's not really totally capable of understanding how a great God reconciles with a sinful man. How this great spirit reconciles with us peons. How does that work? Well, you know, that's an important study. And you can spend your whole life studying that. And some people do. They spend their whole life studying this. And they come to conclusions and thoughts and things they think. But I would just say that it's more complex than any individual theory. But it's kind of the sum of the parts of many of those theories that, that God is just doing. It's a miracle. It's a miraculous work. How does God perform a miracle? How does God speak and things happen? Now, I mean, I know that God speaks and it happens cause effect so to speak but but what are the mechanics that make all that work what are the mechanics that make the relationship between god and man possible and i would just venture to say that anybody that really says they got all that figured out has needs some humility in their life we don't understand that it's just beyond our pay grade now does that mean we stop studying it no absolutely we need to study atonement theories how we come to reconcile with god and how we come to be at peace with god we need to study those things they they're a beneficiary to us as God's people to understand those things. But here's what I want you to remember. And while it's a needed study, the greatest blessing of atonement, the, the greatest blessing of being at one with God, is not how it works, but rather simply the fact that it works. We get to be right with God. I don't understand why. I don't really understand how. 
I don't understand God, the depth of God's love for us. I, I don't understand why when he could have created a billions and billions of people who would serve his every need and, and be basically robots that we would just, just serve him and serve him and serve him without choice. I, I don't know why he gave us the free choice. I mean, I, I've got, I could, we could talk and we could reason together. I could give you some of my thoughts on it. You give me your thoughts on it. But I just, at the end of the day, I don't understand it all. <laughs> but I praise God that it works. Okay? I used this analogy in the past before. I, you know, some of you may be mechanics and you may understand exactly how a car works. I am not one of those guys. Uh, I know a few things. I know if I get in my car right now, it doesn't crank. First thing I'm going to do is plug something up to the battery. And I'm going to plug something up. And it's going to be a little box that I have in my car. I don't even know how that box works. I just know that if I put the black on the black and the red on the red and press the button, that sometimes it cranks. I don't know how it works. I just know that it works, right? I don't understand, though, when I crank my engine, there's a lot of things, it's my understanding, there's a lot of things that happen in those few moments. I have no idea what all happens. I just know that most of the time I crank it and I press, the, I put it into drive and I press the gas and it goes. And I just say thank you, okay? Uh, I don't ask a lot of questions about it. Well, I, I, when we understand how God works and how God brings us into a relationship with Him, I, I'm just, I treat it a lot like a car. I might can understand some parts of it, but at the end of the day, I don't understand all how it all works, but I'm just thankful that I get to live a life as a, as a Gentile that that the relationship works. And while I don't understand all the pieces, and I don't understand all the moving parts, I'm just thankful that I serve a God who welcomes me into His arm despite all of my flaws, all of my imperfections, all the things that should keep it from working. I'm just glad that the relationship between me and God, I, I crank it and it works. And I don't take credit for that. I give all the credit to God for making it work, for bringing us at one with each other. So you want to understand all these theories of atonement and things. Uh, you won't see me getting into them in great depth, but Paul just went through one of them there, one of the things that people deal with. But I just want you to know that if, if you're going through those things and you're trying to understand them intellectually, that's great. But at the end of the day, the most important thing you need to know is that God has made it work. And we can praise God for being the recipients of a God who's made it work. He's put us at one with Him. Not through our goodness, not through our work, but through the goodness of a God who loves us and sees us as His children despite ourselves. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for bringing us to you this morning. Even this avenue of prayer, we don't understand the mechanics of it. But we're, we praise God that it works, that you hear us, that you hear your children, that your children can benefit from being in relationship with you. God, we sometimes, in our scientific way of thinking, God, we, we want to understand all the details. And God, just, I just pray that you would stop us all sometimes and let us just sit in wonder and in awe and in majesty, your majesty. To understand that however it is that you bring us into relationship with you. That we're just thankful that you have worked. God you are so good to us. And we don't deserve it. And we praise you for your love for us. And in Jesus we pray. And the church together can say amen. Amen, amen. Jesus alone is enough. I, I hope you know Jesus. And I hope you put your trust and your faith into him one of the beautiful things that jesus did and god did is jesus also brings us this unified group of believers that when we're going through struggles when we're going through the stuff of life uh, we have a, a support system not only with god but with each other and maybe you're just you hit a r rough patch in life and you need some help through that rough patch just don't leave here without letting somebody know let somebody know you're struggling and you're hurting let's let's pray together uh, I've said before, I want this to be a place that, you know, the traditions that we have, we have traditions, and not all traditions are bad as long as we recognize that they're traditions. One of the traditions we have is we usually sing a song at the end of a sermon. Uh, that's not 
found in the, the Bible anywhere. Okay, that's something we've done for generations. We got it from some other religious groups we brought over here. It's not bad. But you need to understand that your opportunity to come and, and tell people what's going on is not just when we stand up and sing a song, but we're rather called to be a family. And so don't leave here. Uh, you can let it be known publicly, but just don't leave here without letting someone know, hey, I'm struggling, I'm hurting, or, man, you, you know what else you need to do, church? You need to be a, a people that you see, when you leave here and something good's happened to you, tell somebody. God's been good to me this week. Huh? Let me tell you about what God has done for me this week. And I, I hope we become more and more as we uh, hopefully are, are shifting into a, a new area of ministry in the, the days to come as we kind of come out that how this pandemic, that we'll just be more and more ready to say, listen, that we want to embrace each other and love each other everywhere we go. But you do have this opportunity. You always have this opportunity to say, hey, I need lots of prayer. I need everybody to know what's going on. And we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to work with you. You can let that be known while we'll stand and sing together.